Hi, and welcome to High School Physics Explained. Today, I'm gonna to be looking at the DC motor, its basic features and how it works. Now, I have produced a video earlier that looks at motors and generators and the differences between the two, and I reviewed how the DC motor works, but I wanna concentrate a little bit more specifically on the DC motor to help further your understanding. And I'm gonna review the motor effect as well as the various parts of the DC motor and how they are important for its workings. And I made this little model here to help us demonstrate that. So stay tuned. So what I have here is a model that I made of the DC motor. So before I go into how it works, let's just identify the parts. So the first obvious things here are these two boxes here. These represent our magnets. And so what we have, red is traditionally used for the North Pole and the blue is used for the South Pole. So we have magnetic field lines running from the red to the blue or the North to the South. We then have our loop of wire here that's going to carry our current. So that's often referred to as the armature. Uh, so uh, in this case, I've got a nice rectangular uh, shape here, uh, but often this can be circular as well. Then the next thing here is this little metal link here, which is clearly separated by two sides. This is called the split ring commutator. And the split ring commutator, and we'll discuss in a moment of how significant that is. Then we have what we call the brushes, which connect the commutator to the power supply. The red is traditionally, of course, positive, and the black is negative. So therefore, the conventional current is going to go in from the red and so forth. So let's see how then it works. And we're going to start in this position now. We're going to ignore the fact that this is not physically touching. For the sake of my demonstration, we're going to assume that it is touching. So we're going to have a current coming in from the red terminal and it's going to go down this side over here. Now that means we're going to have a current going in that direction from this particular side and that current is going to go around the loop and it's going to come back at this side. Let's just deal with the motor effect first. Since the current over on this side here is heading towards you and my magnetic fields are going from the red terminal to the blue terminal, we can use our right hand palm rule to determine the direction of the force. And so I'm going to place my hand on the actual demonstration. My thumb press uh, goes in the direction of the current. My fingers direction of the magnetic field. You can see that the force will act down. Now, no matter what position I have my loop in, this section of wire here will always be perpendicular to the magnetic field for all intents and purposes. And we will ignore the curvature of the magnetic fields up here. So therefore the direction of the force is always downwards on this side. And on this side, of course, the reverse is true. I'm using again, my palm is going to now face up because I need my current to go other ways. Now I can't <laughs> retract my palm, but as a result, it's going to go this way. The thing is for the motor effect is that the current and the magnetic field need to be perpendicular to each other. So in other words, this section of wire in this position is not experiencing any force whatsoever because the wire carrying current here is not perpendicular. It's in fact parallel to the magnetic field lines. Now, uh, for some of you who are using the Fleming rule, that's fine. In this case, you use your left hand and you, you have this position like so. And the way to remember the various fingers is think of FBI. F is the force, B is the magnetic field, and I is the current. So in my case, if I want to orientate this to this situation here, I have the current going this way, I have the magnetic field going this way, and therefore my force is going downwards. And of course, the reverse is true on this side. What's going to happen is, is that this is going to experience a force downwards and this is going to experience a force upwards and it's going to start to turn. And what we have now is a rotational motion and it's going to create a torque. It's going to start to turn. Now, as this continues on, these forces continue to be in the downward and the upward direction. But let's see what happens over here. Over here, when we get to this position, then what's going to happen is, is that there's going to be a disconnection of current because I have the split now connecting to the brushes. And so therefore, there's no current going in the loop whatsoever. Now, why is that important? Well, let's ignore the fact that we have a split ring commutator for the moment. Let's say that this side continues to receive a current going in this direction. That means by the time it goes into this position, this side will receive a current again going towards you. But as a result of the fact that it's going towards you, it's going to experience a force again downwards and it's going to start turning back the other way. And we don't want that to happen. We want it to continue to rotate around. So what 
what we do is this. As this starts to turn like so, what we want is that this side of the wire, this part that's experiencing a force upward, we want it to now to experience a force in the downward direction to continue the rotation. That means this side of the wire now has to receive the incoming conventional current. And that's the purpose of this split ring commutator. Now this side of the wire is experiencing the input current going again along here and out there, it's now going to continue to experience a force in the downward direction. And likewise, this is in the upward direction like so. And that of course repeats. So as a result, this side will always experience a force downward direction if it's receiving a current going in that direction in this particular situation. And so as a result, it will continue to turn. And so therefore what we have is a DC motor. We are applying here a direct current, red terminal, black terminal, positive terminal, negative terminal. By, by the use of the split ring commutator, we can ensure that this continues to turn. Now, the force that these two sections experience is constant, but not the torque. Now the torque is the actual rotational force that's being applied and the maximum torque is determined by how far it is away from the center of return, which is the radius over here, multiplied by also the force that it's experiencing, but the force needs to be at a right angle. So in this case, my force is upwards and therefore my angle between my coil here is 90 degrees. In other words, it's perpendicular. I'm going to get maximum torque. In this case over here, I'm not going to get maximum torque because my force is still upwards, but you can see that the R value or in the moment is actually not at 90 degrees. And the angle we actually measure is the angle inside here. And therefore the torque is equal to FR sine theta. So therefore at this position, sine theta is equal to zero and, and therefore we have no torque whatsoever. Where here theta is 90 and therefore sine theta equals one and you have maximum torque. Well, I hope that's helped you understand the basics of the DC motor. Please make sure you press like and maybe add a comment if it's particularly been helpful for you. And remember to subscribe to my channel, hitting the bell so that you get always the notifications for my latest videos. My name is Paul from High School Physics Explained. Take care. Bye for now.